Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, penultimate session of our series of uh, 10 presentations on the growth of government uh, in the United States. Uh, today's uh, talk uh, pertains to the growth of government uh, along non-military lines since World War II, and I'm going to spend uh, quite a lot of time talking about uh, what I view as uh, uh, the second greatest uh, period of non-war crisis, uh, although in a sense that's misleading because war was going on at the same time, uh, the war in Vietnam, but uh, a great deal of this uh, period's uh, crisis atmosphere uh, had, had to do not at least uh, directly with the war, but uh, with other things as well, especially with the civil rights turmoil of the time. Uh, and uh, this gave rise to uh, a number of uh, new government uh, actions and programs, laws, uh, many of which are still in effect today, uh, most of which, I, I suppose, are still in effect today. Uh, and uh, in many ways, it, it, it seems to uh, be more comparable to the New Deal period than to, say, uh, what happened during uh, either of the World War periods. Uh, so uh, I, I view it that way, and in my work, uh, in which I've concentrated heavily on uh, the effect of crisis, uh, I, I see these years as crisis years, uh, forming a kind of a discrete episode. Uh, I think uh, the period from the end of the, the, the fighting in Korea in 1953 for the next decade or so are relatively placid. <laughs> Uh, and then we have a period uh, of about 10 years, let's say from approximately 1963 to uh, about 74, uh, in which uh, all hell's breaking loose just about every year in some way or another. And uh, this, of all the crisis periods I've studied as a historian, is, is the only one that, that I myself personally <laughs> experienced uh, as an adult, and, and uh, therefore can, uh, can appraise a little differently. And uh, my, my personal appreciation of, of living through these years was that uh, just about everybody in the country had the sense of crisis, that, uh, that the world seemed suddenly uh, full of turmoil and conflict and uncertainty and <laughs> And uh, we were not shocked when uh, outrageous uh, or big political events took place. Uh, when, for example, political leaders were assassinated, uh, as uh, uh, several were in the 1960s, uh, uh, the president himself and, and, and a few years later his brother, who was an aspiring president, and Martin Luther King, and uh, people of major political importance were being killed, <laughs> and uh, that's not a routine kind of event in this country, uh, but it was just one of those uh, extreme aspects of these years, which uh, presented all kinds of extreme actions and gave the character of, of danger, uncertainty, uh, apprehension. Uh, to uh, everybody living in the country at that time. So uh, uh, in retrospect, I look back and I see the period since the early 70s as, as relatively placid, as, as really quite different from what it seemed to be dur during that time. I don't, I don't believe we've had anything comparable since then. We've certainly had times when the populace became hysterical, as I indicated the other day they did in 1980 uh, with regard to the Iranians, but uh, it, it was a different kind of hysteria, a tightly focused uh, one and uh, not so generalized as the, the sense of apprehension felt by Americans uh, during this uh, 
period that coincides just about precisely with the time in office of Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon as presidents. We can pretty much say that this starts with the Kennedy assassination and ends when Nixon leaves office, if we want to put dis discrete beginning and end to it. Uh, Rothbardians like to talk about uh, the welfare warfare state uh, to characterize the nature of what others call big government. And I've talked quite a lot about uh, the warfare state uh, in earlier talks. And uh, today I'm going to be concentrating on the welfare state. And uh, it, I want to recommend to you a book uh, that deals with uh, many of the topics I'll be touching upon today by Alan Matuso. Uh, he's a historian who teaches at Rice University. Uh, he's not a libertarian. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how to characterize uh, his ideology, but uh, he, he's a very good uh, historian, and I believe a very honest one who does not wear the blinders of left liberalism that uh, at least 90% uh, of practicing uh, historians now do in this country. So uh, his books are, are, are very uh, well documented and well, I, I believe, thought out. And uh, this is a very revealing book, I believe, about the nature of particularly the uh, social programs undertaken by the Johnson administration. Uh, and, and other programs in the Nixon administration, too. He, he, he's also written a, a later book that focuses on Nixon and his policies, and uh, uh, I recommend that one also, but it's not quite as, as focused on my subjects today as The Unraveling of America, a very, very fine book. Well, what I've already tried to suggest is that uh, this uh, decade was one marked by uh, a great deal of unrest. And uh, much of the unrest took visible form of political protest in, in a way that we hadn't uh, often seen in the past. Uh, in, in World War I, for example, even though many people didn't like uh, the fact that the country had gone to war on the side of uh, the Allies, uh, they didn't get out of the street and protest, in part because they would have been arrested if they had done so uh, and uh, put in jail or deported from the country or otherwise shut up. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, as I indicated yesterday, many people actually came to to oppose the war as the casualties mounted, but they didn't get out in the streets and protest the war. Uh, they, they did make their views known increasingly through ordinary political processes so that Truman became quite aware by the end of his term in office that uh, he was a profoundly unpopular person with no political future of any kind, uh, if he should even try to have one. Uh, but uh, even uh, before this period began, uh, we were seeing in the United States uh, a, a, a more active, visible, kind of in the street level of politics. And it began with the civil rights movement, uh, which uh, has many antecedents, uh, and we can trace them all the way back to the war between the states and the emancipation of the slaves. But uh, it, it began to heat up, as it were, in the late 1950s uh, to really spread, uh, to uh, gain confidence, uh, to uh, mobilize more and more people, uh, not only blacks who decided they had had enough, but, uh, uh, but many white people as well uh, were part of the civil rights movement in those days and were uh, viewing the situation of race relations in this country as profoundly unjust and uh, demanding change uh, of, uh, of a variety of kinds, but, but above everything else, the end of legal segregation, which still existed throughout the southern states at that time. 
So the civil rights movement uh, attracted people to, um, to stage sit-ins uh, in, in, in for, for example, uh, lunch counters uh, uh, where uh, the seats were reserved for whites and so black people would just go sit down and, and of course they wouldn't be served but they refused to move either until the police came and arrested them. Uh, and and uh, of course, if, if if enough people do this, it, it's like a sit sit down strike in the General Motors plant. It's very hard to remove hundreds or thousands of people who just peacefully walk into some place and sit down and won't move. So uh, that uh, that kind of uh, protest action uh, became more and more frequent in the late fifties and early sixties. Uh, in addition, a number of people began to to take actions to to register uh, blacks to vote, uh, and uh, at that time, uh, of course, this, the laws in the South did not simply read "no black may vote" legally. Uh, the uh, restraints on black voting were more subtle than that, and and they took a variety of forms, uh, including. Uh, such things as poll taxes, which had to be paid, and you had to be on record as having paid by a certain time before you would qualify to vote, uh, or you had to pass a test of citizenship in some states. And, and of course, the uh, people who administered the test were, were all white people who, who, who might find just somehow that blacks were never sufficiently well, uh, well informed about to, um, the matters they tested upon to qualify as passing the test uh, to obtain voting eligibility. So uh, just, just lots of little tricks like that had been adopted in the South starting way back in the late 19th century when, when uh, the Jim Crow system really developed in the formal sense. And uh, so the, they, they had been in effect for a long, long time, and they, they were w well worked out by Southern uh, state and local officials by that time. So people m began to move around and, and, and not only protest these things, but, but, but challenge them in the sense of taking some well-educated black person and, and putting them there to be tested uh, uh, by the... Uh, voting tester and, and demonstrating that it was a farce that when this person was failed at the same time some some wretched illiterate to redneck was being swept right through and passed that it was clear that it was nothing but racial distinction uh, being made. So uh, those kinds of actions uh, uh, increased and in places where blacks uh, could vote more readily, uh, there was great variation across the South in the strictness with which these kinds of restraints were being imposed. In some places, they weren't so strict, and there had always been a few blacks almost everywhere that managed somehow to vote. Uh, in, in places where they had more access, then, then uh, people came in and, and began to, to work to register them. Say, look, you know, we, we can get you to the polling place if, if we'll just register you properly, so let us help. And a lot of young, uh, idealistic white people joined this, this kind of action in the North, college students for the most part, uh, especially in the summertime when they weren't in class. And they'd come down to the South, and they'd go out into... Uh, various rural areas even, uh, where it was most dangerous to do this sort of thing, uh, and uh, help uh, blacks uh, get registered to vote. Well, th this was all a kind of public, uh, political, collective action that was new, at least on the kind of scale we began to see in the late 50s and early 60s. So that by the time we get to 1963, and, and, and the great march on Washington, D.C., where Martin Luther King gave this famous speech, we hear replayed over and over and over every Martin Luther King Day uh, about having a dream and so forth. Uh, uh, by that time, this is a mass movement, a mass movement of blacks and whites nationwide with a lot of support behind it. So uh, that, that, in a sense, has set the tone. Now, when, when the... Uh, the United States, which uh, had started putting uh, quite a lot of troops in, into Vietnam in, 
in the early 1960s, uh, began to put massive numbers of troops there in 1965. Um, uh, protests uh, broke out, uh, particularly on college and university campuses all over the country, uh, because everybody had a model. Okay? Everybody either had seen or had already been part of the civil rights demonstrations and knew that if you're unhappy with some public policy, well, hold a demonstration. Uh, hold what was then called a teach-in. And uh, the uh, anti-war professors would, would get together in some university hall and invite students to come in, and they'd give them speeches explaining why the U.S. military engagement in Vietnam was wrong and why we should take action to to uh, oppose it and to make our views known to public officials and and so forth. So there was a lot of that going on. As early as 65? Uh, as, oh, yes, much of it in 65, a little bit of it even earlier, uh, in fact, but it really uh, spread in 65 and 66. Uh, so uh, we, we've now got two big movements happening that have mobilized millions and millions of people in active, uh, visible, in-the-street politics. Uh, that's not the only place these issues were coming into the political arena, of course. They were also uh, being discussed and, and, and in a way dealt with through the normal political channels, through political party activities and, and more conventional means. But in those areas, uh, uh, let's say, uh, more conservative elements tended to control the setup. So we didn't see so much uh, visible pro-civil rights or anti-war politicking there for several years. Now, eventually, even the conventional uh, uh, political machinery absorbed those issues. Indeed, we're, we're overwhelmed by those issues. Uh, also, uh, but it took several years. After 1968 and the Tet Offensive, uh, when, when many people decided that, that uh, the Vietnam War was a terrible idea, uh, particularly in the uh, Democratic Party, large numbers of people turned against the war and began to uh, express their uh, political opinions and influence through party channels. And uh, indeed, 1968 marks a turning point for the uh, factional support of U.S. foreign policy. Up to that time, uh, from World War II to 1968, there had uh, prevailed a so-called bipartisan support for U.S. foreign policy to a very high degree. Uh, many people now tend to forget that it was the Democrats who were the classic Cold Warriors. Uh, after all, you know, it's Dean Acheson writing the present at the creation. And I always love that title. It's just as if he was an innocent bystander there, you know, when the Cold War broke out. <laughs> I, there I was uh, trying to innocently be Secretary of State when, boom, the Cold War broke out. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Uh, anyhow, uh, it was the Truman administration that set this entire Cold War ball in motion so far as the U.S. part of it was concerned, and, uh, and the Republicans just came along later and decided, well, yes, we have to do this, this too. Uh, but from 1968 onward, big chunks of the Democratic apparatus became anti-war and have remained uh, hostile to, uh, to uh, the kind of international belligerency that became associated with the Republican Party since that time. And that, of course, is a switch from the old pro-isolationist Republican position of the, of the 1920s and 30s. So we've had this kind of uh, uh, turnabout in the, in the party lineup in relation to uh, foreign policy positions in the United States. And, but 1968 was a critical year uh, for that switch. Uh, at the same time as the 1960s went on, uh, this kind of culture of protest became embedded in, 
in wider cultural protest, just just kind of a, a counterculture in general, anti-authority, a, a kind of hippie, dropout, smoke dope, to hell with the system, the establishment, all those kinds of code words that people like to throw around in those days. Uh, that was pretty much new. You know, there had been... <laughs> Beatniks and you know guys in Greenwich Village from way back, uh, but uh, they were definitely a tiny group of people. Uh, when we got it well into the mid 1960s, this kind of anti-establishment countercultural movement had become massive, and millions and millions, particularly of young people, embraced it and decided that they, they didn't want to be part of conventional, respectable society and ways of life. And so that colored, to a large extent, uh, the politics uh, of this period, uh, because a lot of it uh, came, became, in a sense, a war between the defenders of respectability, old-fashioned type respectability, and the challengers and nose-thumbers of respectability. Uh, and... Uh, uh, such such symbols as men with long hair uh, came came to mark that divide. Uh, later on, of course, uh, bizarre things happened, and 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 some of the most anti hippie elements, like working class uh, young whites, adopted the long hair and stuck with it longer than anybody else. Uh, so <laughs> you never know what's going to happen to symbolism once it's loosed in the world, but. <laughs> Uh, but beards and long hair started out as the countercultural's uh, counterculture's way of uh, of making uh, visible its contempt for conventional standards of respectability. Uh, you know, things just turn into fashion statements. They they have a way of losing their content, particularly after commercialization gets hold of them. Well, uh, all of this turmoil and ferment and protest uh, had a lot of political effect. Uh, Johnson, uh, being uh, propelled into office by Kennedy's assassination, uh, this is where I wish Murray were here to give us a quick five-minute explanation of, uh, of uh, <laughs> who really shot Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> because he would always say, lone nut, right? Lone nut. Uh, after all, who stood to benefit? Uh, <laughs> and uh, that would be uh, most entertaining. Uh, whoever shot Kennedy, and I have no idea myself, I have suspicions, but uh, I'm, I'm quite confident it wasn't the man who was officially blamed for it. But uh, at all events, uh, uh, Johnson was a very ambitious man uh, in the classic American political, uh, even Southern sense, uh, kind of given to populist coloration and expressions of sympathy for the poor and downtrodden, uh, and, and a little different from the classic Southern demagogue because he, he affected to care not only about the poor whites, but also about poor blacks. Uh, and uh, that, that was uh, uh, one of the hallmarks uh, of his political ambition that, that m much of what he supported as president uh, seemed aimed at alleviating poverty, of, of uh, helping people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, particularly if they'd turn around and vote for Democrats, uh, which they, they could be counted on to do. Uh, Johnson's Political hero and mentor uh, had been who else but the sainted <coughs> FDR. And so uh, he not only had learned his politics in the New Deal school uh, uh, and acquired his ideological propensities to the extent that he had any uh, there, uh, but, uh, but he had acquired a, a level of ambition uh, that led him to look back to the New Deal as a kind of standard. He wanted to be a great president, and he knew that to be a great president, you had to do things on the scale of the New Deal. Uh, 
So he understood that the New Deal had been immensely successful politically, that is, it was just a great setup for buying votes from millions and millions of people, who, many of whom had never voted for Democrats before, such as blacks. Uh, and it was also a way for him to realize his boundless ambitions. So he, he plunged into the job, uh, and he came, he came to the job very well prepared in the sense that, that he was a recognized master politico. He had been a, a leader in the Senate be, before he became vice president, and he already had a, a, a high reputation as an arm twister and persuader. And, and if you've never seen any of those old films of Johnson uh, getting in somebody's face, to talk to him uh, in the Senate or in the ante room of the Senate, they're they're very worthwhile because <laughs> there's nothing quite like it. I mean, the man was kind of a combination between a bully and a serpent and uh, and a you know, good old boy, and he, it's hard to describe him in action. Uh, he'd literally get that far from somebody's face and kind of bend over and hear these people are backing up. <laughs> and... Uh, and yet it worked for him. Uh, he really was able, he understood the system, how, how Congress worked, where the, the strategic positions were, who had to be brought on board, who owed what political debts to whom. He really knew the political system inside and out and knew how to work it. And so uh, he was in position as president to... to, to to use all that political knowledge, but of course now he had much more power than he'd ever had as a Senate leader uh, because he had all the discretion that uh, rests in the hands of the President of the United States. Uh, he, he supported the Civil Rights Bill that was uh, pending at the time he became President, and that became uh, the first of a number of uh, very important legislative enactments during uh, the <coughs> decade we're talking about now. Um, uh, I, I listed a few of these in a table in my book, Crisis and Leviathan, uh, but it's a very small sample. Uh, one could easily make up a list uh, five or ten times bigger and still have only uh, genuinely important enactments in it. But the Civil Rights Act was, uh, was truly a, a, a whopper of a law. It, it has a whole uh, litany of parts uh, having to do with education and, uh, and uh, public housing and, and employment and, and so forth. And, and one of the things that, that clearly uh, uh, differentiates it from from previous uh, civil rights laws is, is that, it, that it's not just something stipulating how government must deal with citizens. It moves beyond government uh, to put restraints or requirements on private individuals and the disposition of their property. So that if, for example, you, you, you have a hotel or a motel, uh, that may be private property, but you're no longer in a position to say with whom you will deal. Uh, if you have a hotel and a black person comes in and wants a room and you have a room and, and, and be, because you don't want to give a room to a black uh, guest, uh, you turn that person away, then you have violated a federal law. Right? Uh, and likewise for people who keep a a restaurant, and, uh, and so forth. It had al always been the rule, of course, that people had these signs up saying, you know, we reserve the right to refuse service. And uh, in, in, throughout the South, of course, they had si signs that said whites only on places that wanted whites only. Uh, so th those sorts of things became unlawful. And uh, employment relations were uh, no longer... Uh, open to uh, the choice of the contracting parties exclusively. If I refused to hire or fired somebody just because of race, I'd violated the civil rights law. So, so uh, freedom of association was, was extremely infringed uh, by this law. 
Uh, and uh, this law has been in effect ever since. There have been some amendments, but uh, actually only amendments that strengthened it, <laughs> none that, that weakened it. So this was a big change in, uh, in the government's involvement in race relations, and it, it spilled over. And indeed, what I want to suggest to you is that, is that just as uh, the civil rights protests uh, kind of spilled over onto, into educating the anti-war movement about how to go about uh, carrying on their protests and so forth. Both of these big political issues and movements uh, spilled over onto a whole host of uh, other political uh, controversies, some of which might not seem to be very directly related at all, but were easily seen as, quote, logical extensions of, of anti-war or pro-civil rights actions. Uh, environmentalism, feminism, uh, a whole host of actions on behalf of, uh, of groups that, uh, that had never been viewed as minority groups in the past, uh, say the elderly, uh, Certainly women are a majority of the population, but they became viewed as a, as a minority group deserving of some kind of uh, federal government uh, protection on the, in the same way that blacks were being protected by the Civil Rights Act. So, so the spillovers were huge during this period from the core issues of war and civil rights to a lot of related issues. The, uh, in 1965, the, the Voting Rights Act, which I, I see I didn't even list up here, uh, was passed. And at that time, uh, the federal government put its might uh, behind this, uh, this uh, effort to, to ensure that uh, blacks could not be uh, kept from voting by the, the standard uh, devices used in the southern states for decades. The so-called war on poverty was made a, a big part of the Johnson program. Uh, that, that had also begun to heat up in the early 60s. Uh, when Kennedy was president, there were some, some token efforts made by the federal government to, uh, to uh, do something about poverty. And during the Kennedy administration, they, they took the form, for the most part, of, of regional development uh, programs, uh, such as a program to, to assist uh, people in Appalachia, uh, which was viewed as a, a, a backwater where, where there was little economic activity. And, and the, of course, the interesting thing about regional development or community development or any, any such programs which, which, which proliferated and became lodged in, in the government in the 60s and uh, are still out there is, is they always presume that people are stuck in some place and if that place is not doing well then you've got to somehow pour subsidies or special assistance into it rather than just suggesting to people that they should go somewhere else where where more opportunity exists uh, it, 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 it's as if somehow they're either incapable of getting off their butts and moving uh, or that it would be grossly unfair to expect them to do so, notwithstanding the fact that millions of us every day do get off our butts and precisely go somewhere else in order to improve our well-being. Uh, nothing could be more routine in this country than moving someplace to find better opportunity, and yet all of these geographically defined assistance programs seem to, to work in opposition to to that uh, obvious truth. Well, the war on poverty uh, took the form of a whole host of uh, federal government programs in, in areas where the federal government had not been much involved before, education, uh, training, uh, a, a, a lot, lot of uh, sort of community make-work programs. There was something called c community action Grants and they became a, a real doozy of a uh, 
of a waste of money uh, trying to buy a few votes in neighborhoods all over America from from poor people and from blacks, and a lot of them fell into the hands of local criminal entrepreneurs uh, who used, used the money they pocketed for all sorts of activities, everything from running their drug businesses to, <coughs> to just having a good time. Uh, Alan Matuso's book uh, has quite a bit of information about the community action grants. and. Uh, Head Start was put into effect, uh, you know, reaching down to preschool children who uh, were, were seen in those days and, and indeed still seen by some people in some places as, uh, as, uh, as needing federal government assistance. And uh, the belief has been that somehow if you can just uh, uh, do a little more to, uh, to teach if, four- and five-year-olds what's going on and uh, socialize them a little bit so that they do better when they start the first grade, then you have made a permanent boost in their trajectory in life. A number of studies have shown, I think, quite decisively that that's just not the case, that even the benefits that seem to come from, from the Head Start program uh, evaporate quite quickly so that after a few years there's there's not no uh, effect anybody can find between the children who who went through head start programs and those who didn't so it uh, it was one of those uh, one of those uh, heart-rending appeals that uh, that were made frequently uh, in connection with these uh, kinds of programs and uh, it's just, just based on bad information, among other things. Food stamps were made a mass subsidy during this time. And they were not only made available uh, to give people a, uh, a kind of ration, ration ticket to, to cheap food, but, uh, uh, but the government made big efforts to go literally door to door telling people about uh, the the food stamps and letting them know that, that that they might be eligible or that they were eligible, so 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 go down and get some. <laughs> and so the program grew very quickly and uh, and uh, became a multi multi billion dollar per year uh, operation. Now it's instructive because in many ways it's. Uh, uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good example of how a lot of these programs work. When you look at the anti-poverty programs, if you have any kind of sensibilities in public choice training, you say, well, well, the, the, the poor don't have any political clout. Why would they ever get anything from government? Why would anybody who can actually exert control over the political process squander that by letting anything slip away into the hands of, of poor people? Uh, if anyone can be neglected in the political process, surely it's the poor. Uh, why do they get anything? And I think very often we find that they're just a cover. <laughs> they're an excuse for something that really channels benefit to somebody who is politically influential. In this case, for example, the food stamp program, this was something, one of many government programs that propped up the demand for what farmers produce. And they were well organized and politically influential. And so this, if you look at how the votes line up on this, you see this curious kind of coalition of uh, Midwestern farm-connected senators and representatives voting along with with people representing black constituencies in the big central cities of America. Well, that's not a typical lineup, but that's the one you see when they vote on the food stamp program. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a fraud, as, as, as most of these programs, if not all of them, are. Starting in 1965, uh, we uh, got the... Uh, I haven't listed it either. Uh, this, uh, this was regulatory legislation, and so that, that explains the failure uh, to put the Medicare program there, although a number of regulations came along with the Medicare program. It, it's, it, it's not a uh, 
a regulatory program per se. Uh, Medicare was created in 1965, and another huge piece of legislation that has turned out to be a, a whopper, uh, comparable to the Civil Rights Act, and in terms of fiscal impact, maybe even a bigger deal. Uh, I just happened to see yesterday, uh, posted on a list I get every day, an abstract of an article about Medicare, because, of course, there's a great crisis now about the cost of Medicare. And someone had gone back and found that when Medicare was uh, created, uh, th there had been projections of what it would cost. And uh, they had projected that by 1990, uh, it would cost a certain number of billions per year to provide this subsidized uh, medical care uh, for the elderly. Well, if you look at what the actual 1990 cost was, it was, it was not simply more than had been forecasted. Uh, it was seven times what had been forecasted. Seven times, director. <laughs> now, now, if you were running a business and you couldn't forecast any better than that, you'd be broke in a day. Okay? <laughs> and uh, in fact, these costs got out of control immediately. Because what they did was to, to, to create a, a so-called insurance, but basically just a setup for, for the government to pay hospitalization and doctor's bills uh, beyond a, a very small uh, amount paid by the patient. And so the marginal out-of-pocket cost of consuming uh, the, these health care services was zero. Well, that's a good price. Uh, if, you, if you've got any ache or pain, then, uh, then go to the doctor. If you're worried about anything, get yourself uh, put in the hospital. So that's exactly what people did. Furthermore, the medical establishment, having, having fought socialized medicine tooth and nail for decades, uh, and uh, Having failed now, the federal government has come in and, and halfway socialized medicine by, by embracing what looks like a small group of people, the elderly, but in terms of medical care is a giant share of the medical care market because they're the people who have this big demand for it almost day in and day out. Uh, that was not a foot in the door. That was everything but a foot in the door. So... so uh, uh, the doctors uh, have fought, the, fought this kind of uh, intrusion, but no sooner had the program been thrust on them than they fell deeply in love with it and discovered that this was just a total boondoggle that they could exploit right and left and rake in the loot. And so pretty soon the combination of the, the unlimited demand by elderly patients and the, the game playing by doctors who who would, you know, do every test you could think of and, you know, readily send people to hospital confinement. And uh, why not? There, you know, there's an additional amount to be collected by them er er every time they make a move. So uh, there, was, there, there was nobody uh, watching the store as to how much they charged. And, and so this was, this was heaven on earth. And so the combination of the, the suppliers... Uh, uh, taking advantage of the program, and the demanders uh, exploiting it to the maximum drove these costs up at a very high rate. And indeed, they're still going up at a very high rate. So this program has become uh, gigantic. Uh, I'll put some data up in a minute to show you just how big the increase has been. Uh, a series of laws were passed uh, having to do with uh, consumer protection. I'm saying, well, how's the consumer come into here? Well, we're sort of protecting defenseless people under Johnson. So some people claim consumers are defenseless. They're just at the, at the mercy of greedy sellers, and capitalists, and people who, who foist incomprehensible contracts on them that they, that, that they have no choice but to sign. Okay? <laughs> Because, of course, they can't just say, no, no, thank you. I don't want this good or service. Uh, so consumer protection laws, uh, the Truth in Lending Act in 1965, uh, a, uh, uh, 
Consumer Product Safety Act uh, a little later in 72. Uh, and uh, on both ends of this period, related to FDA uh, powers were created in 1962, uh, very important amendments to the Food and Drug Act uh, were, were put into place that, that have had a major impact on the well-being of, uh, uh, of all of us, actually, and if not directly, then poten potentially and indirectly, because they, they had big effects in reducing the rate of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry and <coughs> bringing about long delays between drugs that were created and their, their availability on the market. So the uh, FDA amendments of 62, and then in, in 76, just after the end of this period, uh, similar laws were put into effect for medical devices with the same result. So we've got uh, more, more protection, and uh, remember to apply Higgs, Higgs' law of political rhetoric here. When, when something is described as protecting us, chances are very good it's harming us or even killing us. Uh, so uh, that was certainly the effect of these FDA law changes. Uh, the coal mine safety law was passed in, in 1966. It's interesting that the, uh, by 1966, the accident rate in coal mines had fallen to probably 10% uh, of what it had been at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's very often the case that after something has happened uh, uh, on its own, uh, the government comes along and, and, and passes a law against what has almost disappeared already, and then people assume that, but for the government, we'd still be having coal mines just as they were in 1890. Uh, but uh, that was not the case. Uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed in 1990, a much broader law affecting uh, uh, workplace safety and uh, leading to a very uh, intrusive bureaucracy that has created headaches for employers all over the country by enforcing a lot of uh, uh, of ostensible safety regulations, many of which are are not sensible or or worthwhile in terms of their costs and benefits, uh, and and many of which are just simply idiotic. Uh, anybody who ever worked in a in a dangerous workplace understands, uh, first of all, that most of the accidents are are caused by carelessness or by by people just doing something that they they already know not to do. Uh, but they take chances or they, they, they just say, oh, hell with it, and they don't do what they, they know is the safe, safe way to do something, and, and an accident results. So uh, as long as you have human beings, especially the kind of human beings that work in factories and mills and farms in this country, uh, you're never going to get rid of all the accidents, no matter how you regulate the workplace uh, because uh, I maintain that workers will find a way to hurt themselves. And they're very clever about that. I used to work in a factory uh, part of the time when I was growing up, and uh, I've seen some pretty gruesome things, uh, all of which were owing, all of which were owing strictly to stupidity. And uh, uh, and I'm not denying it. I acted stupidly myself on occasion, too, but I was lucky. I just n never had the nail come down on me or the gear eat up my fist. Uh, in 1969, something called the National Environmental uh, Protection Act was passed, uh, and, uh, and it's from that that we get this requirement for environmental impact statements that have to be written up and approved before big uh, public projects can be carried out. Uh, of course, we, we know that that became a way for environmentalists to halt projects <laughs> by challenging those statements and, and even going to court about them if need be. Uh, so that, that became a really swell idea. Uh, in 1970, the Clean Air Act amendments were passed uh, and then uh, Nixon gave uh, in, uh, the EPA uh, enforcement power over the uh, air pollution uh, regulations, and in 1972, the Clean Water Act, as it's usually called, 
was passed and EPA took over enforcing that. And uh, those became uh, uh, the authority by which the federal government has imposed massive costs on all kinds of producers ever since. And uh, uh, some people argue, in fact, that the productivity slowdown that took place from the early 70s uh, onward for decades and, and maybe still can persist despite the apparent speed up of productivity in the late 90s, uh, that slowdown in the rate of productivity growth uh, owes a great deal, maybe even the greater part, uh, to uh, the, the uh, anti-pollution laws and the way that EPA not only chose to enforce these laws, but to, but to keep pushing the envelope. These laws were fairly broad, and EPA was authorized to spell out the details. Well, they've got EPA lawyers working day in and day out, spelling out more and more details, pushing these regulations out, making them more stringent all the time, and imposing more costs on the people who have to comply with them. Nixon was supposed to be a, a, a conservative. Right? <laughs> uh, there's, a, um, there's a book by Herbert Stein called Presidential Economics, I actually recommend this book. Stein is not, certainly not an Austrian economist, uh, was not. Uh, he was a kind of uh, conservative Keynesian, I guess is one way to describe him. Uh, but he was not a stupid guy, and he circulated throughout his life uh, in or near uh, high policy-making levels. And so he had a lot of uh, good observation and experience uh, to guide his writing. Uh, yeah, that's right. He's the father of Ben Stein, the uh, rather inspiring actor. <laughs> uh, apparently, Herb was a funny man himself. I, I never knew him. But uh, this book, Presidential Economics, uh, has a chapter about the Nixon administration, or maybe more than one, uh, called uh, a Conservative Men with liberal ideas. And I think that really helped to capture why the Nixon administration played out as it did. Nixon was supposed to be a conservative. You know, he'd come up as a, as a rabid anti-communist. That's how he made his political reputation in the beginning. And, uh, and he'd, he'd, he'd served as a kind of a attack dog for the Eisenhower administration. And a lot, a lot of people disliked him because he was a, he was a, a, a kind of man full of rage, it seemed. You know, like he might blow up at any given moment. <laughs> how much of that was real and how much was posturing is hard to say because he, he was not a guy, I think, who ever really revealed his true self, if indeed he had a true self. Uh, but... Uh, but uh, but but Nixon cared about sort of being seen as an ideological throwback. On the one hand, he understood, for example, that wage and price controls were futile. That you know that was not an effective way to control inflation. He didn't care a lot about economics. He was really more interested in foreign policy. But he understood uh, that 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 wouldn't work as an anti-inflation program. Uh, but at the same time. A lot of respectable people, all the Democrats and, uh, and a lot of professional economists in the early 70s were recommending a so-called incomes policy, wage and price controls, because the price level had begun to creep up. Uh, and, and high levels of inflation had not been seen in this country since the Korean War. And people began to get really worried about 3 or 4% rate of inflation as measured by the standard indexes. So Nixon, perceiving this to be a political threat to himself, uh, looked at this advice that he should clamp down legally on wages and prices and, and stop inflation by law. Uh, and he thought, well, that's dumb. Uh, but then he decided, well, yeah, it's dumb, but that's what people want. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, in, in 1970, uh, Congress passed something called the Economic Stabilization Act. And th this was a kind of ploy in its own right, a dare, if you like. 
because these Democrats, uh, uh, giving Nixon more credit than he deserved for honesty, thought, here's this conservative who despises wage and price controls and is on record as saying they're stupid, so he'll never put them into effect. So they passed a law authorizing him to put them into effect. And the idea was, now, uh, this inflation, we will blame on the president. We'll say, we've got this terrible inflation of 4% a year, uh, and the president has been authorized to stop it, and, and the blockhead won't do it. He won't use the very authority we've given him. Well, <laughs> he showed them. <laughs> he turned around in August 1971 and imposed this, uh, this very creative uh, new economic program. I really, I really doubt that any of the people who, who concocted this title uh, knew that Lenin had called his program of 1921 the same thing, but, uh, well, just an accident, and they do happen. Okay? So uh, part of the new economic program was comprehensive wage price controls, starting off with a, a f total freeze of 90 days in which it was unlawful for anybody to change a wage or price at all. Imagine that, locking the price system absolutely rigid for three months. I mean, that doesn't seem like very long, but, but prices change every day. Every day. Millions of prices change to some extent. Some change a great deal on any given day. So the idea that no harm will be done, and in fact good might come from locking the price system in place for 90 days, was uh, was a, a a level of an <coughs> abysmal economic understanding. Uh, Nixon's advisors, his economic advisors, knew this. Uh, even though they weren't Austrian economists, they they were <laughs> economists of some kind, and even neoclassical economists understand this. So Herb Stein and his colleagues on the Council of Economic <laughs> Advisors knew that this was a stupid idea from an economic standpoint, but they weren't the ones making the decision. Indeed, uh, the decision was being driven uh, mainly by the advice of John Connolly, the Texas politico who had, who had been brought in to be, of all things, Secretary of the Treasury, and had been given additional authority, uh, making him into a kind of all-around economic czar. Well, what did John Conley know about economics? <clears throat> Basically zero. He didn't know anything, uh, but he was a successful politician, and he, and he believed in the grand gesture. In, uh, in fit, football metaphor, which Nix, Nixon liked to use, uh, Conley believed in the big play. You know, you've got... You've got third down and three yards to go, so drop back and you know, go for the end zone 70 yards away with the Hail Mary pass. That was Connolly-style politics. Uh, so uh, Connolly said, we'll, we, you know, we'll do the shocking thing. We'll really get attention brought to our program with this new economic policy. We'll, we'll stop inflation cold with a freeze, and then after that we'll lighten up a little bit and let let some adjustments take place, but we'll keep the controls in place. We'll stop inflation. The people will love it. You know, the grandstands will go wild with applause. Uh, and, uh, and in addition to that, they closed the gold window. They stopped redeeming gold for anybody, even foreign <coughs> cent central banks. So that was the, the total end of any semblance of the gold standard in this country, August 15, 1971. Uh, they, uh, they, 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 they imposed a surtax on imports, uh, and they uh, added a, a list of other uh, measures in their, in their plan, all of them goofy, uh, but, but grand and shocking and attention-getting. Uh, I mean, none of us could ignore this price freeze. <laughs> that was for sure. All the consumers are quite aware of that, and every seller. So, so they did this. And then they, they progressively, first after the 90 days, uh, administered the prices for a while. And, of course, everybody was coming in wanting exemptions and special treatment and appealing, and, and as they always do when you, when you run a program like that. And, uh, 
So it became a hodgepodge of arbitrary and capricious administration. Uh, but they knew they couldn't do this for very long without wrecking the economy. Even Nixon understood that. So their idea was they would gradually loosen up, and, and by, the, by the time they, they got down the road a little ways, uh, Nixon would have been reelected, and, uh, and everything would be irrelevant anyhow after that point, so they could abandon the controls and go back to letting the price system clean up the mess. Uh, that was the plan. Uh, things didn't work out quite according to plan because the program began to unravel quicker than they thought and their enforcement wasn't very good and the prices began to go up again. So uh, Nixon decided in the middle of 1973, against everybody's advice, to put another freeze on. And that time, uh, the effect was immediate and disastrous because then... Uh, farmers stopped selling any steers to the meat packing plants, and you know there was no hamburger in the supermarkets, and uh, poultry farmers were drowning their chickens rather than bringing them to market. And when these kinds of news items appeared in the paper, the, the <coughs> political blowback was was terrible. And so after about a month, they 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 lightened up even on that second freeze and began to to move to a final phase of administered controls, which allowed all kinds of adjustments and dis uh, discretionary uh, relief to particular sellers. And then when the law, the Economic Stabilization Act, expired in uh, April 1974, they, they, they said, adios, uh, been nice to know you, and, and everybody was happy to have these price controls over with. But meanwhile, they had done a lot of damage to the uh, workings of the economy, and they had uh, uh, damaging legacies. One was that, that while they had been in effect, uh, the so-called energy crisis had burst forth uh, in 1973 in the form of the OPEC embargo, uh, and uh, that, that action w w would not have had much impact on anybody except that these price controls were in effect. <laughs> and with the price controls in effect, uh, the price system couldn't uh, serve to, to help people adjust uh, to the effects of the embargo. And, and so uh, these uh, limited supplies of petroleum products were were rationed by the usual kinds of uh, rationing devices when there's great excess demand, uh, the, the gas lines. Gas lines, and that, that, that was almost a first. You know, gasoline had been short during World War II, but in those days there was a system, a rationing system. You didn't have to line up and sit in your car for four hours to get gas. You just had to acquire enough ration tickets to buy the gas that was available. Uh, in, in the fall of 1973, people didn't quite know what was going on. They just knew that, that a lot of gasoline stations ran out of fuel or didn't have very much and, and, and that uh, a lot more motorists wanted to fill up. And so people were lining up and sometimes sitting in their cars for hours and hours waiting to, to get to the pump uh, to buy some fuel. Uh, of course, this, this was a situation in which the sellers with only a limited amount available, uh, could, could, could suit themselves. Say, since they were able to sell all they had uh, available and they could only charge the controlled price, well, the, the, the way to improve their well-being was to cut their costs. Their revenue was going to be the same no matter what, but their costs could be uh, reduced by such things as closing the station most of the time. <laughs> so they, you know, they, they had to spend less for wages and spend less of their own time there and, and, and what have you. They could also uh, stop providing uh, additional services that they had in the past provided to people uh, to entice them to come and buy gasoline. You know, cleaning your windshield and checking the air pressure in your tires was routine service at gas stations before 1973. After that, it just about disappeared. It was no longer part of the protocol of the uh, pump attendant. Uh, they stopped uh, opening uh, service bays. Uh, 
where people could get repairs made on their cars. And well, that's not worthwhile anymore. Uh, and so, and so the people found themselves short of fuel and wasting tremendous amounts of time in these gas lines, and, and they went crazy about it. Uh, some people absolutely went ape. They, they couldn't stand this. Americans had never had to, had to deal with these kind of communist lineups before. Uh, that, you know, everybody in the Soviet Union stood in a line for 60 years. And they were used to that, but Americans weren't used to lining up to buy something they'd normally been able to buy in five minutes. Uh, so it made a lot of people angry. Uh, I was living that year in California, actually. I was, I was working at Stanford that year, and, uh, and, and the Californians, I think, went crazier than anybody because they have an automobile culture. And so they were goaded painfully by uh, these gas lines. Uh, uh, w one morning I turned on the news and heard about some, some, some guy who'd, who'd run out of gasoline out in the country somewhere. And it made him so angry uh, that he had, he had taken his gasoline can, he had walked five miles to the next station, he had somehow managed to get a can full of gas, and he had walked all the way back to his automobile with it, poured the gas all over his car, and set it afire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another fellow somewhere in the Bay Area where I was living uh, got so uh, impatient waiting in line that finally he pulled out of the line and began to systematically ram every car in front of him with his car until he'd rammed five or six and finally disabled his vehicle. <laughs> so it's obvious that Americans are not really cut out to be good um, Q standers. <laughs> And these gas lines were just intolerable. Uh, and they were unnecessary, too. They were wholly the product of price controls. They, they, they would have disappeared instantly, and it, as indeed they did disappear instantly when finally the price controls were taken off. But meanwhile, uh, when the comprehensive price controls expired in the spring of 1974, this so-called gas crisis, or oil crisis was still going uh, big time, and so the government in its wisdom decided that it wouldn't let the price controls expire in that sector. It would keep the controls on uh, fuels, and it did, and it created a series of uh, administrative uh, organizations to, to, to allocate petroleum and its products to different users in the country and uh, to manage this system, which it could not succeed, of course. Uh, the energy czar, uh, Nixon uh, named uh, William Simon to be the energy czar, and he became probably the most newsworthy man in America for years. He was on the news every night uh, answering questions and explaining the situation to people. And, and uh, in the late 70s, uh, after he had left the government, he, 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 he went on from energy czar to be Secretary of the Treasury, uh, for which, oddly enough, he was, he was much more qualified than most Secretaries of the Treasury. But, uh, but he wrote a book called A Time for Truth. And uh, you should read this book. It's, it's really good reading. Uh, and uh, it, it's his kind of first-hand report on the stupidities of attempts to economic, uh, uh, do economic planning uh, by the central government. Uh, and, and it's very good reading. I, I don't know if he had a ghostwriter or not. I, I suppose he, he didn't. Uh, I, I used to, to, to know Bill Simon personally, uh, uh, so I, n I just never asked him if he, he sat down and wrote that himself or also not. Also the father of Simon who just ran for governor. Yes, right. I think father was a bit brighter light than son. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so, but, but si Simon was an interesting character, too, because uh, ju just as LBJ was an abrasive character, Bill Simon was an abrasive character, too, and he would get right in people's faces. And for that reason, he, he had no political future after he left the, the, the government in 1977.
uh, even even uh, conservatives and Republicans couldn't stand to deal with him. He was he was not sufficiently uh, amenable to compromise with people who differed with him. Well, uh, it was not until, of course, Re Ronald Reagan was elected that ultimately these price controls on on oil were. Uh, finally abandoned for good. Uh, and meanwhile, we had that second energy crisis in 1979 and 80. Again, gas lines uh, and all the screw-ups uh, that had occurred in 1973-74. Uh, and uh, they, they, they disappeared instantly, you know. The minute the price controls came off, all the problems went away. Uh, the gas lines uh, disappeared. Stations had fuel, uh, and, uh, and, and, it, and, and it showed that uh, the, the entire problem that people had put up with for a decade was wholly artificial. Uh, it didn't have to have happened. It was put there by politicians uh, trying to give the appearance of doing something that, that uh, helped people, such as controlling inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot more here, and I'm not going to uh, walk through every item uh, because our time is limited. Uh, let, let me just say a little bit about some of the um, enduring legacies of what was done during this 10-year period. Uh, there, there were many, I think. Uh, some of them were institutional. A lot of these uh, government administrative agencies, uh, uh, programs, laws, and so forth, uh, remain in effect today, uh, and uh, there were uh, there were very serious fiscal implications. I mentioned the Medicare earlier and how rapidly its costs ran up. Uh, in, in 1980, uh, Medicare had already become vastly more expensive than anyone had expected, and the cost in 1980 was 32 billion dollars. Uh, that was more than initially projected it would be in 1990, several times more. So it was, it was growing very fast. Uh, in 1990, Medicare costs were, were $98 billion. And in 2002, Medicare costs were $231 billion. Uh, this thing is growing exponentially at a very high rate. And uh, it will, uh, it will before long, unless something is done to, to change the program, it will be uh, the one big gorilla that eats the entire federal budget. Uh, but it's not the only one that's, that's behaving this way. When, uh, when the Medicare law was being debated in Congress, uh, uh, Wilbur Mills, a, a powerful congressman from Arkansas, who headed the Ways and Means Committee of uh, the House of Representatives, which is a, exactly where you want to be if you're a congressman or woman, uh, probably the most powerful position you could hold. Uh, Wilbur Mills used his clout to stick something else into this bill, uh, a little thing called Medicaid. And this was uh, to subsidize the medical care of poor people. Eventually, it spread out, and <laughs> as they all do, and embraced the not so poor, and uh, people in other categories were swept in too. Uh, sixty-five. It was part of it was part of the original act of sixty-five. It, it was a multi-part law. Uh, part of it created Medicare, uh, another part Medicaid, and. Uh, if we follow that, we find that uh, I don't have Medicaid singled out here, but in the, uh, in the table I just looked at, uh, there's a category called health uh, that doesn't include Medicare. And it's, it's, it's for the most part, it's the federal government's payments for, for the Medicaid system. Uh, in 1980, these health expenses were $23 billion. In 1990, they were $58 billion, and in 2002, uh, they were $197 billion. So you're seeing there the same kind of rapid uh, exponential growth of, uh, of uh, expenditure uh, 
Uh, a final uh, big gorilla in this same general category is the Social Security benefits. Now, we know those go back to 1935, and uh, for several decades, they didn't really amount to anything much. Uh, as late as the mid-1950s, you know, 20 years after the system has been created, uh, there's just a almost trivial amount of money being spent on old age pensions. Uh, but uh, the outlays began to pick up, uh, particularly uh, in the 60s and 70s, because Social Security was, was something that politicians in the 50s, 60s, and 70s discovered as a, a, as a, a beautiful campaigning issue. And so what everybody who wanted election or re-election to Congress would do would, would be to promise the voters that if, if you elect me, I will raise Social Security benefits. And, and indeed, I'll take some of you people who aren't eligible for benefits now, and I'll put you into the system, too. I'll put the disabled in there, for example. <laughs> uh, so the Social Security system... Uh, got improved <laughs> every year for about 25 years from the early 50s into the 1970s. And, and the deal got sweeter and sweeter. And the pensions got adjusted for changes in the price level. And at one point, they even got double adjusted because of a, a misconstruction in the law. They, they were adjusted twice over for price level changes. And, well, that's the kind of uh, cost of living adjustment we would all love to have. Uh, profit from inflation. <laughs> so Social Security costs, even as late as 1966, $21 billion. 1980, they'd gone up almost six-fold. They were up to $119 billion in 1980. By 1990, they were up to $233 billion, and in 2002, they were $456 billion. <laughs> so, if you go back and look at the division of the all, all federal spending between, say, uh, these welfare state transfer payments and defense spending, okay? In the mid-50s, Defense is way up here. It's well over half of all federal spending. And these welfare transfers are down here at about a third of the budget. And then there's everything else making up the difference. But what happens in the late 60s and early 70s is that as fractions of the budget, they change places in a, about a 10-year period so that by the, by the mid-70s, uh, the proportions are almost the exact opposite of what they had been just a decade earlier, and, and then the divergence just keeps getting bigger as these transfers get a bigger and bigger proportion. They're currently about two-thirds of all federal spending uh, and uh, growing. Now, any number of people know this can't continue, <laughs> but... What do the politicians do? Well, even as we enjoy ourselves in Auburn today, they are hard at work adding a major new spending program to the Social Security program, prescription drug benefits, which is forecasted to cost, <laughs> in the Republican version, a mere $400 billion. What is 75 uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, multiplied by seven, and you see that prescription drugs alone will take up 90% of the federal budget <laughs> in 10 years. <laughs> so, again, this is no secret. We all know this. People all over the country know this to be the case. But what are these politicians finding in their interest? They're finding it in their interest to go on wrecking the economy and the society by making these promises to people that they know cannot be fulfilled for long. But all the long they care about is next fall. Okay? These are promises that will help these guys get themselves reelected 
in 2004. You can bank on it. That's their specialty. Where I'm always saying, what do they know about this? What do they know about that? Well, there's one thing they do know about, and that's what you need to do to get reelected. We know they know that because every year, almost every one of them gets reelected. So they understand. They've proven they understand how the system works. And if wrecking the economy and wrecking the society uh, is what it takes to get reelected, then they are fully prepared to wreak wreckage. And that's what they're doing right now. Uh, much of this we owe to this great period of turmoil and uh, social unrest between 1963 and 74, which built into our polity and our institutional arrangements a series of time bombs. Well, let me stop here and take your questions. Bob? I know when I talk to people now about the gas line, many people think, oh, it's because OPEC mm -hmm. did what they did. Right. At the time, were there at least some op-ed writers that, that knew what was going on and explained to enlightened people? Uh, very few, I would say. Very few. Uh, so of course, people were making all kinds of suggestions about how to improve things. Uh, but the suggestion of, of uh, getting rid of the price controls was, it was not unheard, but it was, uh, it was far from frequently heard. I think Friedman was probably one of the only major ones. Yeah, Friedman used to write a Newsweek column, and of course he, he, he was making uh, the, you know, the correct analysis of the situation, and there were others, so uh, uh, clearly some people were saying the right thing about it, but if you, if you just looked at all the big city uh, uh, opinion columns, I'm sure you would have found few of them recognizing what was really going on and what had to be done about it. Yes, ma'am. I thought that um, prescription drugs were being attached to Medicare and not Social Security. It's the same law. Uh, okay. Medicare is part of the Social Security system. Well, there yes. Joe? Before you're talking about um, safety regulations, I remember um, about 1972 reading a story in the paper. Some guy decided to work on Saturday, a rainy day, probably working in two inches of water. <laughs> he didn't work with just one electric screw gun, he was working with two. <laughs> so, of course, he got electrocuted, there was no OSHA inspector around to stop him from doing this. You know, I mean, these things happen. I mean, I, I, I quit a job once because these guys would build this redneck death trap, which they called scaffolding. And it was the unsafest thing you've ever seen. You'd walk out in the middle of the board and you'd sink about six feet and you'd go over where you're supposed to be working because they wouldn't put a decent board in there. Well, all you can do in a case like that is quit the job. That's, that's my own you know, sort of safety inspector taking over. There's no people lack common sense. Uh, yes, sir. Um, you gave us some of the figures on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security benefits. Yes. Do you have the figures on what they're drawing in on the revenue side? Uh, I do have those. I've got some some data uh, with me, as it turns out, so I can check those for you if you'd like to to see the revenue. I I think I've brought that that part of the data. Uh, by the way, uh, if you ever are interested in these things about the gov the government's budget, uh, you can go online. And uh, just do a Google search for uh, budget of the United States, and it'll take you to uh, the website uh, of the uh, of the uh, Bureau of Management and Budget, and, and to the budget documents, <coughs> and they're PDF files. So what you're seeing is exactly what you'd see if you had the hard copies of these documents. And every year, uh, the budget of the United States, besides having all the proposals that the, that the executive branch is, is sending to Congress, has a volume uh, of historical uh, series, uh, which uh, pulls together just all sorts of uh, categorizations of the federal budget going way back in history. Uh, so, so it's a, a very useful source, I, I find, uh, for my own looking into exactly how uh, big some of these programs are and how much they've grown. Brad? Um, the Immigration Act of 65, 
the what were the political groups that were behind it? Were they the same sort of lineup as uh, I mean, or was that um, sort of spurred by something, by maybe different considerations? I don't. I know it's, um, I know it's totally changed the face of the American you know political landscape. Mm -hmm. but I wonder how it fits with what. I, I can't tell you with any precision what the coalitions were uh, to change that law. I, I do know that uh, a, a lot of people who had come to the United States were, uh, were unhappy because they were unable to bring other family members here to join them. Uh, we still at that time had the old quota system that had been put into place in the 1920s. And the original quotas were themselves based on the relative numbers of different uh, national groups in the country in, uh, in 1920. So the quotas were very high for a lot of European countries, uh, which were places uh, from which relatively few wanted to come to the United States. So many of those quotas were not filled uh, in the 50s and early 60s, whereas uh, other parts of the world uh, where many people wanted to migrate to the United States had, had very, very small quotas. Uh, so uh, uh, there was a pressure, and I don't know exactly what interest groups or what members of Congress were, were involved in, uh, in actually pushing that law to enactment, but, uh, but I do know there was a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the old quota system because it had pretty much become a relic of a very different uh, prior age. Joe? Well, I see a claim when I read some of these left-wing magazines that would search quite a few, and they say, well, it's true people complain about being put in jail for filling in a ditch, but I think air quality is better. Yeah. They make this claim, well, air quality is better, so right. that sort of justifies the whole ecological yes. establishment. Right. Where, where do they get this... Uh, well, there are, there, there are data measuring air quality levels for a number of uh, substances that EPA has been measuring. And uh, if you look at just the concentrations of ozone or particulate matter or, or nitrogen oxide or so on and so forth, uh, you can find a data series. And, and almost all of those uh, particular measures of pollution levels do show declines in the past 30, 30 years or so. Now, uh, m many forms of pollution uh, were declining long before there was an EPA or any federal uh, intervention in, in this area at all. So uh, it doesn't follow, of course, that EPA made these declines happen. Uh, but even if EPA uh, did make them happen, it doesn't follow that it was good to make them happen because we need to know what the costs were uh, and how much people value having these lower levels of, of uh, pollutants in the air. I mean, the, the environmentalist assumption is always that lower levels of pollution are ipso facto a beneficial thing. Uh, but even apart from what it costs to get those lower levels, it, it's just not the case because we may be at such low levels already for many of these uh, things that get into the air that, that, that they just don't have any effect on anybody. So what's the point of reducing their levels even, even further? It, uh, it, it won't necessarily do anybody any good. Mark? Um, I'm very interested in the, the period that you addressed, um, the Nixon administration basically, mm -hmm. the closing of the goal with the price controls right. and Watergate and all that stuff. <laughs> It almost seems like it really qualifies as one of your crisis periods, and I was wondering uh, what would you recommend in terms of uh, the best sort of comprehensive overall history of the price and wage controls and the closing of the gold window and all mm -hmm. of that business? Uh, uh, one book that I think is uh, quite worthwhile is uh, is by Schultz and Dam, George Schultz, who was himself a high official in several different capacities in the Nixon administration during those years and, and went on later to become Secretary of State and an all-around military-industrial complexer uh, heading up Bechtel and uh, he's covered all the bases. I, I would love to see a really good Life and Times biography of George Schultz because that would tell many tales. Uh, but uh, Schultz and Dam published a book, I believe, in 1977 
Uh, Kenneth Dam was uh, a lower lower level functionary, uh, and uh, he's been in and out of the government several times himself. Uh, this book is called Economic Policy Beyond the Headlines, and it's it's quite worthwhile. It's got a lot of information about all those policies you mentioned. Karen? You're also on the board there, too, so. Uh -huh. wrote a book about two years ago on the Nixon economy. Yes. And it's a great down right. on all the Nixon evils. Yeah, I re yeah, I referred elliptically to that book a while ago. I recommend that, too. Yeah, that's a very, very good source as well. Well, I think we've come to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob.